All right. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get rolling with our next speaker. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of her. Maybe you've, some of you have aspired to be as cool as her. Um, <laughs> but but uh, as it says here, Lonnie Mal Malmberg has a herd of over 1,200 goats that she takes upon requests to offer environmentally really good jokes are being told. I can't wait to hear what they are. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, so Lonnie is going to share with us some of her experience at doing what I understand to be one of the most innovative and effective uh, invasive species removal, but also land restoration practices in the history of the world. And as it says here, Lonnie Malmberg has a herd of over 12,000 goats, 1,200 goats, let's say 1,200, 12,000. You could handle 12,000, though, if you had to. <laughs> but she takes upon her quest to offer environmentally friendly, chemical-free land restoration. Lonnie Malmberg is also possibly the coolest person ever in the history of the world. And so I'll, with that, I'll go ahead and introduce you all to Lonnie Malmberg. Boy, I think Brett just made that up, but that's really cool. This is how I usually work and how I dress. I have, wear boots and jeans and hat, and now it's summertime, so I have a great big hat to keep the sun off me. But when I come to town, when I come to Rome and try and act like the Romans, and I want to dress like city folk, I got these pointy red shoes. <laughs> and to me, this is fashion, and it's really fun to get to wear some fashion. So first of all, um, how did we get here? Well, I'm going to go all the way back. And all of us keep saying the same things of how did we get here? How did this start? But I'm going to go back about 10,000 years. Y'all know what was the first domesticated animal? Goat. Goat. Yep, that's right. 18th, 19th century, the Industrial Revolution. And then 1930, the Great Depression. The people who lived through the Great Depression, my grandparents, my folks, was so powerful on them, and they never forgot it. So me being the first generation out, I was taught lots of things. I didn't live in the Great Depression, but I was taught so many things you'd have thought I did. My kids ha have no knowledge or no, I mean, it took two generations for that to all go away. Then we got the Green Revolution starting in the 1940s in Mexico. We had to grow more calories per acre, and we did that really well. And we did it with bigger and bigger and bigger machinery, force and destruction and more chemicals, more technology, genetic engineering. This is all about control. We are a culture of controlling everything and war. The chemicals were developed for warfare. World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam War. Agent Orange was half 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T. In 1945, when the war got over, the chemicals were being given to farmers or sold to farmers, marketed to farmers. Also at that time, they started feeding corn to cattle. There was no such thing as corn-fed beef before that. Big machines. I just took this picture. I happened to be working in southern Nebraska. And I got this job. It's Eastern Red Cedar Tree Control. That's what I was hired for. And I took this picture. This gigantic tractor, every day he'd have um, some implements on going up and down over these fields and spraying the heck out of it. This is in March. These things are going down the highway. I could have driven right under that. You see um, signs like this everywhere. And uh, it says, mix this with your herbicide and bump your yield. It's amazing. So 1962, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. And then over on this side, and I kind of wrote um, you know, this is like point counterpoint. So Rachel Carson in 62 is the first one to say, wait a minute here, we need to look at something. 1974-ish EPA was formed, Clean Water Act. 1975, Federal Noxious Weed Act. 1980, Jay Feldman begins <laughs> in camp. 1990, Lonnie goes to college. <laughs> in the 90s, um, okay, I want to have you notice something here. On the right side, we have huge corporations, government agencies, gigantic money, power. And on the left side, it's a single person. 
Rachel Carson, one person. Jay Feldman, one person. Me, one person. So I go to college, you know, and I just went to college because I thought that was my only way out of being a ranch manager of, uh, you know, what was I going to do when I was 50? And I, now I'm 56 and I'm a goat herder. <laughs> I'm almost to the top. So, but when I was in college at Colorado State University, and I'd called around trying to find information on Russian knapweed, couldn't find anything, and I got a hold of George Beck at CSU, and uh, I was asking him about Russian knapweed, and I said, oh, by the way, is there a, a program there I could study Russian knapweed and get a master's on it? And he said, I can't believe you asked me that. I have a program, I have a stipend, I have no student. Do you want it? And I said, yeah, I'll take it. I said, what do I get? And he said, you get a master's in weed science. And I said, I never heard of it, but I really need that stipend because I have, <laughs> have two little boys to raise as a single mother, and I got to have the stipend. So I took it, and that's how I got a master's in weed science. <laughs> while I was there, <laughs> while I was there, I was the only one in the department. First of all, I was 36. Everybody else was 20. And I was a ranch girl and a cow girl. And uh, everyone else was really smart, and everyone else was funded by a chemical company except me. I got a thousand a month, my stipend. I had to pay my own books, uh, tuition fees, everything. All the chemical funded students got everything paid for and 30,000 a year. They all had DuPont caps, coats, wined and dined, three boxes of donuts every Monday morning in the lab and that was my first notice of when you do research and it's funded by a chemical company what do you do you do the question they give you when you do research you, your only job is to answer the question so what is the question so the question was how much should we use it was not is this the best way to control russian napweed that wasn't the question how much should we use? Pint to the acre, quart to the acre, should we spray it in the spring or fall or both? So the answer was one of those. And you know, I was off doing my own thing. In 96, I took a class, Ethics in Agriculture. Dr. Robert Zimdahl taught it. It was the second one in the country. There was only one other one at Cornell who taught Ethics in Agriculture. And Zimdahl brought this one in, so I had Ethics in Agriculture. And we used to sit around and talk, well, OK, chemical companies fund you guys, us, what do you do? If you don't take their money, nobody's in school. What do we do? Take their money and go to school or nobody goes to school? So anyway, then we get into genetic engineering and the seed companies are all bought up by the giant chemical companies. And then we start getting patents on the hybrid seeds. And then there's things like FQPA and, and then, oh, I wanna mention this, EPA stands for Environmental Protection Agency. Isn't that something? <laughs> so, so anyway, in 99, President Clinton signs its executive order. Oh, now I gotta jump over here. When it, the research, and then the landowner or land manager, when they call for help on, I got this Russian knapweed in my horse pasture, what do I do? They call consultants, experts, county extension agents, and the county weed person. And those guys pull from the research and you know the knowledge that's out there and it's only here is about spraying. And it's the not, what is the best thing to spray for, or do about Russian knapweed? It's how much should I spray and which one? So the information gets misconstrued going through these people and a lot of them don't know how research is done and never have thought about that of, you know, what was the question. They don't think about that. They just get that information down here and it, boy, it's really skewed by the time it gets to the ground. The executive order, this is an all out battle. These are serious threats, major economic, environmental uh, damage. The cost is high. This is an ongoing fight. 28.8 million funding to combat invasive weeds. This is war. We're gonna declare war, and to protect our natives, we've gotta kill all the aliens. So now we're up to the 2000s. We have Roundup Ready crops, and then they're banned in Europe. Ethanol starts being made from corn. There's a suppression of science, 
and Jay Feldman gets on the NOSB board. <laughs> and then uh, we have uh, this science is being suppressed. We have activist scientists, and we have brilliant people like Terry Schister, my dear friend who is a brilliant scientist, helping Jay get all this information where it's supposed to be. So now the farm bill just gets signed. And I'm in farm country now because I have my goats in Nebraska. And they're not going to have subsidies given to the farmer now. It's going to the insurance company. I couldn't even believe it. Could not believe it. So I looked up a few facts here. Nebraska, in that acres they have, they, they uh, grow about a trillion bushels of corn. 98% of it is GE. Nebraska just passed Texas to be the number one cattle feeding state. That shocked me. In 1900, Nebraska grew corn at 26 bushels to the acre. In 09, it was 178. And corn hit $7 a bushel a couple of years ago, and they plowed everything a tractor could get to. Remember this from the 30s? Remember? And uh, I was so lucky to get to go see the Sandhill crane migration at Kearney, Nebraska. 600,000 Sandhill cranes. 60% of the world's population comes through that little area on the North Platte River and they stop and eat and rest so they can fly on to Wisconsin and Canada and they're eating all GE corn. These signs, these insurance companies are huge. There's my cranes and they're, they're beautiful birds and these are 10 million years old. That's what they say anyway. So there's a close-up of them. And they stand about almost five feet tall. And uh, they have this red on their head. And uh, they fly on to Wisconsin, where at some point in time, I suppose the natives up in Wisconsin, they called them the, um, or, or the cranes, they called them cranes. But they were coming to the fields in Wisconsin to eat these berries. And the plants with the blooms of these little red berries looked just like a crane's head. So they called them crane berries. And then they dropped the E, and now those are cranberries, and that's how they got their name. I thought that was really cool. I took half my time, huh, Jay? And <laughs> so here I am in Nebraska, and there are my goats, and see this cornfield? They plow everything and put a pivot on it. Here's a pivot, and this is all cornfields. It's plowed for miles and miles and miles. And these are hills. These are rolling hills that shouldn't be plowed. So I took a a class with some of Brett's elders this past summer and he told me that Mother Earth is not happy and she is pushing back. And he predicted at the beginning of last spring, a year ago, he said, Mother Nature's not happy, she's pushing back and you're going to see violence in fire, water, air, and the earth. Earthquakes, fires, floods, and uh, tornadoes and hurricanes. And boy did I see that. And we out we and the goats, we outran fires and floods all year doing our summer work. We were right on the front edge of the Black Forest Fire in Colorado. We were two days out. We just left um, Estes Park, Colorado two days before the thousand year flood hit and wiped out the Thompson Canyon. So we were just right in front of them, but in front of them, thank goodness. But so now here's, the, here's where we are. The old is our culture was based on things and how to control things. Monoculture farms. A wonderful young girl worked for me for a couple years and I found her in Washington, D.C. She worked for Beyond Pesticides. Worked for me two years and she said, the biggest thing I learned from you and these goats is control is an illusion. <laughs> There's nothing like a herd of goats to teach you that. So now here we are with the new, oops, I'm sorry, the new, where now we're moving into the cultures based on people and holistic things. We're gonna work with nature. We want biodiversity, not these monocultures. And the rising awareness, and everybody's looking to the future. The young staff of Beyond Pesticides, I don't know who's all in the room right now, but I applaud you. These are the most wonderful young people. They do great work, and they're fabulous, and they are. Yes, please. And they are, at this point of the a rising awareness in the future, and thank goodness we have them. So what I did when I got out of college, same thing all of you guys I'm sure would do, is went out and bought 100 goats, and I started a business. So I have living machines. 
and I manage these goats to get a goal done on whatever land I'm working on. And I thought, this is great. You know, I got out in 97. This is great as an alternative to chemicals and machinery, where you can't get machinery in. You don't want to spray a chemical or can't because it's illegal by water. And that's why I started this business, because I'm an old ranch girl, and the only thing I knew how to do really well was manage animals and be outside. So got 100 goats and went to work, bought a little bit of a portable electric fence. So what I do is land restoration, but this is a huge paradigm shift of all those things I just showed you about not controlling anything and trying to bolster this system, um, build the nutrition, nurture the soil. It's all about soil. I have to feed the system. I have to recycle this stuff. I don't care if they're weeds. You know, I don't care what they are. I just want to have the goats eat them and recycle them. Rele release all those nutrients, build the soil organic matter, hold the water in place, keep it all there, keep it clean. I want to to feed these things starting in the, in the soil and way through to the people. And I'm going to add all these things. I'm not going to kill anything. I'm going to add, add, add vitality, vigor, joy. There's nothing like a bunch of baby goats playing on a rock or whatever they find to stand on that is really joyful, it's pure joy. A, bo a border collie chasing a stick is pure joy. So I'm just gonna recycle these natural resources and get this energy flow going. I'm gonna recycle this problem to cash. Solar energy's free. I'm gonna recycle my knowledge of being an old cowgirl to cowboy up and take these goats wherever I can go. There is enough. So in 18 years, we do weed management, brush control, fire fuel load reduction, erosion mitigation, flood control, reclamation, and reseeding. I have contracts with federal, state, county, city, private people, uh, local groups, homeowners associations, and giant corporations. This is working for Chevron Oil in Western Wyoming, doing uh, oil field reclamation work. This is a balance of science and art. And I got the science when I went to college. This is the art, managing these animals and getting them to do exactly what you want, where you want, how you want, when you want, and keeping them out of trouble. One thing I want to make a point of here is these giant machines. This is on a Chevron job, too. And uh, they had 60 acres on the north, and they had all these machines. And then I had 60 acres on the south. I said, you know, one of those giant earth-moving scrapers they use for construction, I went and asked those guys, I said, how much does that machine weigh? It was the biggest one. He said 120,000 pounds, or uh, 80,000 pounds. So the biggest machine they had there weighed 80,000 pounds. This herd right here weighs 150,000 pounds, and it's alive. It's living. It's recycling everything it eats. It's pooping. It's peeing. There's about 1,500, that's 6,000 hooves working the earth as they go, and they're self-propelled. <laughs> That's it. One-stop shopping. We do it all. I'm doing 12 things at the same time. I just hate it when people say, you're too expensive. And, and I say, well, no, I'm not. They said, well, I can buy a Corda Tordon for $70. And I said, first of all, you can't compare what I do. I'm doing 12 things. I'm healing this system. You're doing only one step and you're causing about a billion dollars per acre worth of damage that might take 50 or 100 years to correct. I'm doing it all at the same time. And goats are so fascinating. First of all, they're really smart, and they have all these skills that no other grazing animals do. But I always say the goats, you know, weeds are really smart. The weeds are smarter than the, the desired plants, usually. And goats are the only thing smarter than a weed. But the only thing smarter than a goat is a border collie. That's the only thing. And people, and I accept my position, are, I believe people are about eighth, maybe on a good day, right under bacteria. <laughs> goats climb trees, they climb, climb these oil tanks, they run up and down these steps and play, and every goat will be on his own step. Whoops. Um, I work where there are endangered species. These are the western sage grouse, where great sage grouse babies First time seen in 10 years in an oil field I work in, and it's where the cattle have been kept out because there's been no water for three years. And the goats have been in trouble because they 
they always went over here to this place where we weren't supposed to be. Cattle rancher was furious. He went to BLM and tried to get the environmental assessment jerked so we couldn't work there anymore. And now showed up these baby sage grouse that haven't been seen in 10 years. That's where the goats were running to where we we're always in trouble. Goats stand on their hind legs. When I do fire fuel load mitigation, and these are my big weathers. Weather, a weather is a neutered male. When they stand on their hind legs, they can reach about nine feet up. So I want these big boys, and they strip everything nine feet all the way to the ground, and it's all recycled right in place, and that's the best fire mitigation. They're easy to move. You can put them onto a semi. I prefer walking across the country, but I haven't done that yet. I do walk, you know, like 20 or 30 miles. But if I have to go 600 miles, we, we do these four-deck semis. Uh, one time in Boulder, Colorado, the trucker forgot to bring his portable chute, and we stacked five coolers up, and we loaded 1,000 goats on, onto trucks on five coolers. You can't do that with any other animal. We had to restack them several times. When you get to where you're going, a lot of places where I go, you can't get a semi off the road, and you can't get them turned around, so you just get close, open all the doors, and all the goats jump off, and you get the border collie to go put them where you want them. Um, this is, I was on a pipeline way down here, and this is also a Chevron job. Uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. The billionaire's golf course right under Teton Village. This year they called us. They had two budgets. One was for H-2A workers, which they filled. And the second budget they had was for local youth to work. They put out their advertisement for the local youth budget to come and work and, you know, do whatever golf courses do. And uh, one kid showed up. One teenager showed up, he rode a tractor for two hours and quit, and he said it was too hard. So the golf course managers called us, and uh, we took goats there and we worked there last summer, and we had all the budget of the, the good uh, American kids that would not work. We got the whole thing. But you talk about intense, and I didn't go do that job, my son did, because you have to have golf etiquette when you work there. <laughs> And you, you can't yell and cuss at the dogs or anything. <laughs> and these little babies, um, these babies are just a few days old. They start eating weeds and doing their job when they're just a few hours to one day old. Uh, these are born way out in the oil field. And, and just interestingly, does any, anybody, can you tell me what my worst predator is? Well, that's one of them. But this year, I had something very interesting happen. This is in the oil field. And this is like six million acres of unfenced land. It's called the Red Desert in Wyoming. And this section is 50,000 acres. And these babies, when they're one and two days old, walked about 10 miles. And it took all day long. It's really hard. But anyway, there was no shade, because we were doing reclamation work and seeding this bare ground here on these old abandoned locations. The babies would crawl down the badger holes to get shade. So they'd be lined up like you know, train cars down the badger holes to get shade. This is about 7,500 feet elevation. And um, H2S gas is a, is a natural um, uh, product that comes out when you drill natural gas wells. It's highly, highly toxic, very toxic. It's a heavy gas. You can't see it. it smells like rotten eggs. And it gets in big clouds. And since it's heavy, it'll roll down the hills. So, you know, if it's produce somewhere up here, it'll roll down this draw and then accumulate and get all the low spots. And that gas would go down into the badger holes, and the babies would go in the badger holes to get shade. And it took me a while to figure it out. We are getting all these dead babies. I could not figure it out. So yes, when I work in the city, it's people's loose dogs. But this one I had never thought of before as a predator, H2S gas. Um, here's the heroes. The dogs, all you need is one good dog. And uh, the other day in Nebraska, we moved from one um, work site to the next, and we just took off down the county roads and across the country, and you know, like an old cowgirl would. And uh, there's that's my son, Donnie, and two dogs. And this is Sally, the guard dog, she's an Akbosh. And we just took off walking until we got to where we were going. It took us two days. So the, the dogs are the key, and they are the bosses of the whole operation, and they are so smart, and they're magical. Uh, this is my son, Donnie, on an Air Force base, one dog, Zippy. And this is over a 1,000 head of goats, and we went across a bridge, 
and we had exactly 10 days, because on this Air Force Base at Cheyenne, Wyoming, there was an endangered plant, a nox two noxious weeds, and a uh, uh, poisonous plant, all in this one area, and we had 10 days. It was like 120 acres, and we had 10 days to get that done, and we did. Here we are in the middle of Denver, running down the street. I had a job at XL Energy Plant, and uh, he wanted me to run over and do the ponds under I-25. He said, you going to truck them over there? Had 500 goats. I said, no, I'm going to run them down the street with an orange flag. And he said, we're all taking bets over in the office. You'll be in jail by 5 o'clock. <laughs> so I called the cops just so it would be on dispatch record that I'd called first and told them I was going. <laughs> and they sent a squad car to flag us through that stoplight. One dog. These animals have so much respect for the dog and for us and for what they're doing. They're, they're just real easy to handle. <laughs> and here's old Patch. This is how important they are. Canada thistle. It's really important to be on the right place at the right time in the right season because the plants behave differently, the animals behave differently. Everything's is different in a different season. So by knowing the uh, animals and the plants and what's going on with the biology of the plant, tells you when to be there. I want to be on Canada Thistle when it's in full bud. And I don't care what day that is. I don't care what month it is. You know, depending on elevation, it'll change. But when this plant is in full bud, it's just the right height. Because when a goat's walking, it's nose high. Nose high to him, and he can eat this on a high trot and get every one of those buds off and not even slow down. So I can do that really fast. If I have to be here any other time than it takes me much longer to get the job done. So this, we were a little late, because it already had bloomed. But we came in there, and, and this was an afternoon. And the, the grass is, you, you, oops, I'm sorry. The grass is the best competitor, and it's left. Ooh, two minutes. I better go. Um, here's the crew, my two sons. Can't play pasture golf with border collies, because they make up the rules and take the balls. <laughs> here's my camp in Nebraska, where I'm at. My camper, everything I own, has four wheels or four legs, and I go to where the work is. Uh, working here, eastern red cedar tree, uh, this is a corn farmer. He treats his pasture like a cornfield. He wants all the trees gone, and gone instantly. And I said, your problem here, see the pivots all around us in the cornfields and everything's been plowed? I said, your problem here isn't the cedar tree. They're actually trying to hold the soil. But this horrible erosion is from cattle walking in single file, because that's what cattle like to do. They're big and heavy. They walk single file, and they make these cow trails, and then it washes down. And all your water is shooting off here and making these horrible head cuts. That's your number one problem. Your second problem is you have no diversity in this pasture. I can't find any broadleafs except musk thistle, which he hates that too. And he sprayed chaparral herbicide out of an airplane last year, and there are no broadleafs. I said, you have no diversity. You have the poorest quality grass <clears throat> for cattle. In a monoculture here, you have no broadleafs, and you killed them all, and this erosion is your trouble. No cow pies are broken down. I said, you have no life here. No insects are alive. No nutrients are being recycled. If I kick that cow pie over, it's all dead underneath. I said, there's nothing alive here. I have to bring this back to life with my living animals. Uh, this is a place where they, they were really proud that they spot sprayed musk thistle. So this musk thistle turned brown and fell over. And I said, why is this three foot area around here dead? I said, did you use that same chaparral herbicide and you, did you um, calibrate the equipment? I said, oh no, we used the death mix on that one, by God. You have to feed the system, build diversity and stability cows walk in single file. The cow trails that they make like that, so I take 1,100 goats and I walk perpendicular to all the trails that the cows have made to try and get this system, undo these lines. Uh, this is some horrible erosion. Uh, we put them in here for night, three nights in a row. There's day one. Also, cows can't walk on 90 degree cliffs and there's nothing growing there. Day one. Day two, day three. It's 30 below zero right here, and I'm reshaping the landscape with this herd. That's another view. And again, day one, day two, day three. 
and trying to mellow off this deep erosion and this sharp head cut and mellow this back such that now it's a 40 degree angle and uh, it's got all that organic matter tromped in the soil. Now I can stop the water. I just have to, uh, Brett's telling me it's zero. So I'm gonna zoom to the one slide I wanna leave you with. Oh, the turkeys follow me. Do you know the, the symbol of the turkey track is a sign of protection? Uh, turkeys are called earth eagles. There, it's usually when I'm in trouble with a rancher. <laughs> Walk a fine line. I'm doing spring cleaning here at this Nebraska place. Uh, cotton fields, that's a whole other story I didn't get to. Okay, here it is. This is my son, Donnie. Um, organic community, organic gardens in downtown Colorado Springs. We've done this for 15 years in a row. And this is the organic gardens, and then we do the buffer zone around there to keep the chemicals away from the, the gardeners. So this is my son, Donnie. He's 30, and this little girl, and he brought this little girl in to feed. This is Broken Leg. That's his name because he broke his leg, and I said it, and now it's crooked. And I give him an organic pear, and she's feeding him a pear. And what I want you to see in this slide of, you know, the, the culture of control, and now we're culture of people and our hope and looking to the future. This little girl feeding that goat and having Donnie there is pure trust. And these are all living. These animals are living. That system is living. We have to bring the system to life so it can function. Everything needs to function, but it's all got to be alive. And it all is. Thank you very much. You like my shoes? <laughs>